Praise the Lord, saints. Welcome back to the broadcast with Elder Mark Gilbert, pastor of Refuge Temple Church, 4456 Medgar Evers Boulevard in Jackson, Mississippi, where our mission is meeting people where they are, serving in the heart of the city of Jackson with the people of the city in our hearts. These are our announcements for the fifth Sunday, November 29th, 2020. We want to say Thanksgiving blessings to everyone, and we pray that you had a wonderful, safe holiday as you celebrated with family and friends. We, the family of Refuge Temple Church, love you and are grateful to God for you. Our drive through communion will be Sunday, December 6, 2020, 11 a.m. to 12 noon. Remember, remain in your car and wear personal protective equipment, and our Sunday morning services will begin at 12 noon. The Brotherhood Department will have their conference call on the first Monday in December, which is December 7th at 7 p.m. Saints, if you have any questions concerning communion, if you are a widow or you need assistance, maybe you are sick and shut in, email our deacons at deacons at rtccooljc.com. All of our announcements must be received by Thursday at 12 noon in order to be included in our Sunday morning announcements. Remember, we want to hear all about your birthdays, anniversaries, all of your celebrations. So be sure to get those announcements in by Thursday at 12 noon. When donating to Refuge Temple Church, giving up your tithes and offering, use our cash app, which is dollar sign refuge86. You can also use our Giveify app. Just search for Refuge Temple Church, the pastor Mark Gilbert. If you have any questions concerning your tithes, your offering, email the trustees at trustees at rtccooljc.com. And as always, saints, hashtag God is a refuge is our way of celebrating Jesus, and we leave it on all of our social media outlets. Let's prepare our hearts and minds now for the word of God as we hear a solo by Sister Janelle Thomas. Jesus, for my soul has been anchored in you, God. Here's the 
God bless you, everybody. Good morning. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking. Again, I say to each of you, of course, God bless you. Coming into your hearts and your homes, you already know, it's always my pleasure to bring you yet another message straight from the Word of God. Well, I hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving extended weekend with your family and those close to you. I certainly enjoyed mine in this time of rest. And I always hope that you remain safe during this pandemic season. It was my intention, folks, to come before you this past Wednesday night, you know, with an attempt to close out our series on Romans chapter eight. But we had some technical difficulties which prevented uh, me from coming before you. I was not able to uh, make that happen. Then it was my thought that I might come before you this morning and deliver uh, the next part of the Romans eight series. But then I realized that we're in a very important season on the Christian church calendar. Yes, we're in the season called Advent, which means I'm going to have to pause the Romans chapter 8 series for now and make room to talk about a very important season of Advent. Today, right now, this fifth Sunday in November is the first Sunday, the first day of Advent. And since Thanksgiving is over, the world is gearing up for Christmas. And not only the world, but also the church. And you ought to know that uh, our spiritual preparation and reflection over the birth of Jesus Christ comes to us in this season that we're in right now, starting this Sunday, called Advent. Someone say Advent. A-D-V-E-N-T. Advent is a combination of uh, a couple words, but mainly the Latin 
Adventus, which means coming or arrival. For you and I as Christians, Advent is the arrival or the birth of Jesus Christ. So in this season, we talk about the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we will be doing. And so while preparing this message and thinking about Advent, I realized that the term Advent is not necessarily a part of our regular religious language. We use a lot of words uh, that we know instead better. We, we use words like justification and atonement and providence and free will and sanctification. But Advent is somewhat elusive. Uh, you know, there are many Pentecostals, apostolics who never heard the term Advent. For example, in my own life, being born into the Pentecostal church, I hadn't heard the term Advent until I went into Bible college and then seminary for graduate school. And one of the reasons the term Advent, I believe, uh, and its meaning escapes us is because many of us have never been exposed to the Christian liturgical calendar. And the Christian liturgical calendar marks out the seasons of worship in the Christian church and what they mean. In the same way, you've got uh, winter, summer, spring, and fall in terms of seasons. There are also seasons of the Christian calendar that govern your worship and my worship. And many of us have never been exposed to it. So for Bible study this week and the next few weeks, I'm going to be bringing you a series of sermons on Sunday and Bible studies on Thursday uh, that teach and preach on Advent and the birth of Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, the Christian liturgical calendar. We'll talk about that also and why it's important for you and I. But for this morning, uh, let's begin our very first sermon of the Advent season talking about Jesus. Is that all right? And in this season of Advent, as we prepare ourselves to journey through the birth, and the miracle, and the glory of Jesus, I want to share with you uh, a scripture. And I, I want you to, to read with me a set of scriptures as we set the stage for this Advent season. It's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter number one, for our first uh, set of scriptures for Advent. Matthew chapter one, beginning at verse number one. And I believe that this scripture speaks to the Advent season. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. And I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version of the Bible this morning in Matthew chapter number 1. Get your Bible out, your electronic device out, read with me. Uh, we're going to read a few scriptures, but that's all right. We need to read this. We need to read the whole thing uh, to the best of my ability. Here's what it says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Abinadab. Abinadab begot Nashon. And Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Jerom. And Jeram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Amon. Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Sheatel, and Sheatel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abud, and Abud begot Elikim, and Elikim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, Achim begot Elihud, Elihud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Matthian, Matthian begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ 
was as follows. Amen. What is he going to preach from this text? Well, for my subject, I want to use his name is on my resume. His name is on my resume. One of the most prevalent questions for someone who has begun their journey of reading, studying, and understanding the scriptures. The question that arises most from the beginning Bible student in my experience is why are there four Gospels? Particularly, why do they differ in detail and chronology and in structure? If Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all talking about the same Jesus, why do they tell uh, the story of Jesus Christ in a different way? Well, if you have ever asked that question or know someone who has asked that question, the very first thing that you need to be aware of is that no gospel, none, is meant to be an exhaustive list of all the details concerning the life of Jesus. The writers didn't sit down to write an exhaustive biography that covers everything about Jesus. No. As a matter of fact, John, in the 20th chapter of his gospel, at the end of his gospel, wrote that many things done by Jesus were not recorded in your Bible because it's in, it's his, his, his intent, excuse me, was not to give you everything about Jesus. Number two, you must realize that every gospel writer had an agenda. Their agenda was influenced by their intended audience. Each gospel writer was writing to a different group of people and how they told the story of Jesus depended on the crowd they were talking to. Are you with me? It's very similar to trying to tell somebody how your Thanksgiving went. Now, your version of how it went would be different depending on who you're talking to. You wouldn't tell your neighbor the same story uh, you would tell your spouse. You wouldn't tell your spouse the same details that you would tell your best friend. And you certainly wouldn't tell your pastor the very same version that you tell uh, your husband or your wife. Who you're speaking to, who you're talking to, who you're sharing it with will shape how you tell the story. The intended audience of the gospel writers are how they told their stories, particularly in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is why they differed. Stay with me. I've got to teach this morning. Luke, for example, writes to a Gentile or a non-Jewish audience. One of the ways we know that Luke is writing to a non-Jewish crowd is that his gospel takes the time to explain some traditions of the Jews that a Jew reading it wouldn't need to have explained. So the fact that he talks about what the Feast of the Tabernacle is and what behavior in the synagogue was like and what the customs of the temple were, it suggests to us that Luke was writing to some folks who were not aware of those things, which means if they weren't aware of those things, they weren't Jews, i.e. they were Gentiles, so it was a Gentile crowd. Matthew, on the other hand, is writing clearly to a Jewish audience and the reasons that we know that Matthew is writing to a Jewish community is that his agenda in writing is to authenticate the Messiahship of Jesus so that the Jews would accept that he was a son of God. That, that, that Matthew writes to a Jewish congregation because he wants them to see that Jesus is a son of God who he claimed to be, who the prophets prophesied about, that this is the one person that Israel has been waiting for for hundreds of years. And in order to facilitate this agenda, in order to make sure that the Jews received Jesus, there were some things that Matthew did to differentiate his story from anybody else's. Can I teach the Bible for a moment this morning? Number one, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew links us and likens Jesus to Moses. He does this because 
Matthew knows that in a Jewish mind, Moses is the greatest prophet in the history of Israel. He's the lawgiver. He's the figure that God used. And Matthew wants to be certain that the Jews understand that the same way Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, God is now using Jesus to lead the people out of their sins. Somebody say out of their sins. And so in Matthew, more than any other gospel, Jesus is compared to Moses. Beyond that, Matthew also divides his gospel into five sections. The gospel of Matthew is structured around five major speeches that Jesus gives. The Sermon on the Mount, his speech about missionary work, his long discourse on the parables, his teaching about the church, and his teaching about the end times. That there are five major speeches that Jesus gives in Matthew. And Matthew's gospel is structured around the five-fold speeches of Jesus. Someone say five speeches. The reason Matthew divides his gospel into five sections is that it is also similar to how the book of Psalms is divided. Psalms is divided into five sections and the reason why Matthew and Psalms are divided into five sections is because the, in the Jewish mind, when it sees the number five, it automatically thinks back to the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Bible written by Moses to give the law to Israel that shaped them as a covenant people. Teach the Bible, Pastor Gilbert. The Gospel of Matthew is meant to mirror the writings of Moses to prove who Jesus is. And just as Moses gave the law in the five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, Jesus gives the new covenant in five speeches. That's why I love the Bible. Nothing is written by accident. Someone say no accidents here. And the third thing that Matthew does, if you don't mind me introducing this to you, to authenticate Jesus in the eyes of Jewish crowd is how he begins his gospel. Now, unlike any other gospel, Matthew begins his gospel differently. For example, if you, if you read uh, the gospel of John in your devotional time, you'll see that John begins with a theological discourse. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. Life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Notice the thrust of John's theological opening. And then as he opens, he drops down to verse 14 and begins with, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This is he of whom I spoke, that cometh after me, and he's preferred before me, for he was before he was before me, and of his fullness we've received, and the grace for grace for the law was given by Moses, but the grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Notice the theological shift from Moses to Jesus. John gives a theological discourse. But the Gospel of Mark, for example, is different. There's no Christmas story. Jesus just shows up in Mark fully grown. And he shows up and in Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 9, the Bible says that it came to pass in those days that Jesus uh, from Nazareth of Galilee was baptized of John the Baptist in the Jordan and coming up out the water he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove did what? Descend on Jesus and there came a voice from heaven saying thou art my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and the Bible says immediately the spirit uh, driving him up to the wilderness and he was there 40 days tempted of Satan and was with wild beasts and the angels ministered to Jesus. Jesus shows up in Mark chapter 1 fully grown. 
Luke, however, gives us the most detail, but he begins with the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah and the birth of John the Baptist. So beginning in verse number 13 of Luke chapter 1, the Bible says that the angel told Zechariah, fear not because your prayer has been heard and your barren wife, Elizabeth, is going to bear you a son. And what you're going to do, you're going to call his name John and, and, and you're going to have joy and gladness and many going to rejoice at his birth because he's going to be great in the sight of the Lord and he ain't going to get drunk. He ain't going to drink no wine or strong drink and he's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost even from the womb of his mother. That's how Luke starts his gospel. But Matthew begins his attempt to authenticate Jesus Christ in the eyes of a Jewish audience by starting his gospel with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now I know that most of y'all, when you read the Bible, you skip those long genealogies because we don't have time to read he begot him and he begot him and he begot him. We, we just skip down to verse 18 conveniently where it says, now the birth of Jesus is as follows. We don't want to read genealogies. But for the Jews, genealogies were very important. Because one's destiny was determined by one's genealogy. In Jewish life, you couldn't just proclaim to be something that you were not because it had to be founded on who you came from. So an example would be that you couldn't be a priest unless you could trace your genealogy back to the tribe of Levi. That suggested you were a Levite. And likewise, you couldn't be a king or a Messiah if you did not trace your lineage back to David. Someone say, your lineage is important. So when Matthew starts off and wants to tell us about Jesus, he says, listen, I need y'all to know that this ain't just some random somebody who came out the woods. Jesus is not just some delusional made up brother who showed up out of nowhere proclaiming to be who he wasn't. But Matthew says, in order for you and I to understand Jesus, I need to trace his genealogy for you and show you that in his bloodline is Abraham. I feel like shouting already. And in his bloodline is David because Abraham makes him a Jew and David makes him eligible to be the Messiah because he, was, he has a Davidic heritage. And because he's got Abraham, and because he's got David, he can now prove that he is who he claimed to be. Matthew says, listen, if you want to understand something about Jesus, you need to understand who his people are. Someone say, know your people. You're going to understand who his kinfolk is. You got to know where Jesus came from. And so Matthew sits down and watch how the structure of Matthew has theological implications. Matthew says, before I get to verse 18 and tell you about the birth of Jesus, I need to tell you about his family background. Because before uh, the birth of Jesus, there comes some stuff you need to know about Jesus. That, that he didn't just show up in, in, in the world out of nowhere. And if you would understand the redemptive work of Jesus, you must understand something before his birth. You must understand his family background. So Matthew sits down to give us uh, 17 verses of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And so hang out right there with me for a little bit. I know you skipped over these verses, but allow me to preach it uh, this morning and its relevance to you and see if we can make some application to this long genealogy. Are you with me? Say with me today. In the eyes of a Jew, they will usually divide genealogies in the clusters of seven generations. The number seven has significance within the Jewish mind because it was a number of exhaustive completion. So a good genealogy would be divided into seven generations. And notice that's exactly what Matthew does. When you get down to verse 17, he says that the genealogy of Jesus 
can be divided into three groups of 14 generations. 14 is a multiple of seven. Any math scholars in the, in the house? So he says from Abraham to David was 14 generations. From David to Babylon was 14 generations. And from Babylon to Jesus was 14 generations for a total, if you do the math, of 42 generations. Now, if you're old school, you know uh, that you've heard on Easter Sunday, uh, one a preacher say that Jesus came down through 40 and two generations. And that 42 was symbolic of three clusters of 14 generations. All right, Bible study student, here's the problem. If you read the Old Testament and follow the genealogy from Abraham to Jesus, it's more than 42 generations. Somebody say, that's a problem. As a matter of fact, Sister Gilbert, it's probably more like 50 generations. So if you're still with me, Matthew says that it's 42, but the Old Testament suggests it's more like 50, which means that Matthew cut some folks out. I mean, uh, which I understand because, you know, it shouldn't surprise you because if you were doing your family tree, some of y'all probably would cut some people out too because you don't want everybody to know about that uncle that you was trying to hide. So he cuts out some people. And it wasn't really uncommon in that day because genealogies weren't meant to be complete. They were just meant to be accurate. So it was common to cut some folks out because the intent wasn't to name everybody. The intent was to link Jesus to some special people, to some heroes of the faith, to those who had the highlight and the help of their lives connected to Jesus. And those who would have made uh, them proud of being Jews. So it's not uncommon that Matthew would cut out some folks to get to his point. Because if you know your Bible, you would know that Matthew intentionally cut out some ungodly kings in Israel's history. Some unrighteous men and women. Some folks who we don't like to talk about. He, he only tries to lift up the name of those who would authenticate that Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of David, and therefore must be the Messiah. Now, that makes the analogy of Jesus so powerful. But it's not just the names. It's not just who Matthew cut out. It's who he left in. Because when you reread verses 1 through 17, you're going to find out that Matthew, if he's trying to authenticate the identity of Jesus in the eyes of a Jewish mind, and if he's cutting out folks who are unworthy to be named, then there are some folks that he left in that don't make no sense. Somebody say make no sense. So as a matter of fact, if I can take it further, he leaves in the genealogy names of five women. Someone say five women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Now, all my sisters, I need you to know that this, this is not offensive. But to have five women in a Jewish genealogy was not proper Jewish etiquette in that day. Because when you read the founding genealogies of the Bible in Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 10 and 11, nowhere do you find the name of a woman. If you're trying to prove who you are in that day, you didn't link yourself to your mama, you linked yourself to your fathers. And in a patriarchal male dominant society, one didn't authenticate yourself by putting any women in your resume. No, I'm just talking Bible. And yet Matthew, when he sits down to tell the story of Jesus Christ, says that you can't understand Jesus without understanding women that God used to get Jesus here. It's in your Bible. I'm not making it up. That there's no way to tell the story of God's grace when it comes to Advent without lifting up the men and women used by God to get Jesus here. That you can't see Jesus uh, without lifting up the sisters who were used by God. Can I preach Bible? 
cannot, you can't tell the story of Moses without talking about the Hebrew midwives that God used. You can't talk about the conquest of Canaan and not talk about Deborah, the judge, who led them in battle. You can't talk about the prophet Elijah and not talk about the widow of Zarephath. You can't talk about Paul and not talk about Phoebe and not talk about Lydia and not talk about Lois and not talk about Eunice. You can't talk about the church of our Lord Jesus Christ and not talk about Mother Delphia Perry. You can't talk about black history and not talk about Harriet Tubman. You got to talk about Sojourner Truth. You got to talk about Ida B. Wells. You got to talk about Rosa Parks. You got to talk about Coretta Scott King. And you better talk about Michelle Obama. My God. Somebody say, don't forget the women. That when you talk about the story of God and the move of God, you got to talk about the women God used to get Jesus here. Matthew says, you can't talk about Jesus and edit the sisters out. And what makes it powerful is not just the fact that he leaves the sisters in. It, it's, it's about who he leaves in. There's five of them. And just in case you didn't read your Bible last week, let me tell you about the sisters. One of them is named Tamar. Someone say Tamar, T-A-M-A-R. She's in Genesis chapter 38. Tamar has been widowed twice without children by the sons of Judah. And Judah promises to give Tamar his third son that she might have a child. Because a woman without a male child had no security in that day. But Judah reneges on his promise. And so Tamar takes matters in her own hands. She dressed up like a prostitute, went down to the brothel. And when Judah showed up, he didn't know who she was because she was in disguise. He went into her and afterwards she kept some identifying information that belonged to Judah. So that when she came up pregnant and Judah tried to judge her and have her stoned, she pulled out Judah's ring and his staff. And she said in the words of Mari Povich, Judah, <laughs> you are the father. Somebody say he was the father. It's in the Bible. Rahab. She's in Joshua chapter 2. She's a harlot. She comes from the brothel in Jericho. And when the spies are sent into the promised land, they stay in Rahab's house. Now, don't ask me how they knew where her, where her house was. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And because Rahab helped the spies, her house and her were saved when the children of Israel took over Canaan. Then that's Ruth. She's found in the book of Ruth that bears her name. She was a Moabite, which means she was, uh, by Bible, an outsider. She's not Jewish. As a matter of fact, the Moabites were said to be enemies of Israel. Therefore, she's never supposed to be blessed. But she listens to her mother-in-law, Naomi, who tells her how to hook up with old brother Boaz. And she therefore becomes by sacrificing her life for her mother-in-law, becomes the grandmother of David. When the Bible says there's, there's another one named Bathsheba, but it says the wife of one named Uriah. Now, I ain't got to tell you about Bathsheba. I'm just going to say that was a hot mess. Somebody say it was a hot mess. And finally, there's a young girl named Mary, a teenage girl, not married, shows up pregnant, Talking about the Holy Ghost did it. <laughs> so all these women are different. Uh, none of them have a religious resume. None of them have any economic standing behind them. None of them have a degree on the wall. None of them have any fame, any celebrity, any notoriety or any popularity within the Jewish community at this time. Yet when God decides... To make his glory known in Jesus, God uses some women that nobody knows about, that nobody would accept in the Jewish custom. Can I tell you why you should be shouting right here? Can I tell you why you should be praising God right here? Because the message to you and to me is, number one, God can use 
anybody. That's point number one. Let me try it again. God can use anybody. It doesn't matter what they think about you. It doesn't matter what they say about you. It doesn't matter what they know about you. God is so gracious that, that he has a way of picking folks that other people would disqualify and use them for his glory. I feel like preaching right here. When, when, when God chooses and he chooses the way he chooses, he will choose some messed up folks that God chooses and uses flawed folks. God chooses and uses people that don't have glorious resumes in order to use them for his glory. Somebody say, God, use me. Now, until you understand that, You'll never really get happy in Jesus. You'll never truly have peace because you're so worried about what people know about you or what people are saying about you or what they think about you or what they think they know about you. And you're using it as a litmus test to whether God will use you or not. And people have disqualified you based on what they think they know about you. But here's the good news. God will use an imperfect sister to sing a perfect song. God will use a messed up deacon to pray a powerful prayer. God will use a jacked up preacher to preach a powerful word because God has a way of using whoever he put his hands on. Somebody said, Lord, put your hands on me. I came by to tell you that I finally figured out why God uses flawed people. Let me tell you why God uses messed up folks, why God chooses jacked up folks. Make sure you tweet it right. God uses flawed folks because that's all he got to choose from. <laughs> Let me say it again. God uses flawed folks because that's all he's got to choose from. Don't let anybody pull that perfection mumbo jumbo on you no matter how long they've been around because none of us are perfect. You ain't always been righteous. You ain't always been saved. You don't pray and fast 24-7. You have some ratchet days in you, yet God chooses to use us anyhow in spite of us and our days where we are disobedient. Before you challenge me, read your Bible. Noah was a drunk, but God used him. Abraham was a liar, but God used him. Jacob was a trickster, but God used him. Rahab was a prostitute, but God used her. Peter would cuss you out, but God used him. Paul was a persecutor, but God used him. Mark Gilbert was a none of your business, but God used him. God will use you no matter what is on your resume. Somebody say, God used me. He can use what he wants, who he wants. Can give you point number two in this sermon. Not only do we see that God can use anybody, but watch this. God can work through anything. No matter how ugly, no matter how messed up, no matter how broken it may be, God is so omnipotent that God can work through anything. Anybody can get good out of good. But only an omnipotent can take what's messed up and use it to bring forth his glory. Can I show you scripture? Each one of these sisters in the text has a scandal attached to her. One is a prostitute. One pretends to be a prostitute. One is caught in adultery. One who was an outsider. One is a teenage girl showing up pregnant. These are scandals in the Jewish world. And in our judgmental world, especially in the church, we would have disqualified each one of these women on the spot. But the genealogy of Jesus is looking right here at scandal, conspiracy to commit murder, deliberate disobedience, destruction of Jerusalem. And you've got 70 years in exile and then the Bible says in verse 18, after all that stuff, the birth of Jesus followed. Let me try it again. You've got major scandal. You've got conspiracy to commit murder. You've got deliberate disobedience. You've got destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. You've got 70 years of exile. And the birth 
of Jesus, according to Matthew, followed all of that. Third time of charm. You've got scandal. You've got conspiracy to commit murder. You've got deliberate disobedience. You've got destruction of Jerusalem. You've got 70 years of exile. And after all of that, God works through each circumstance and each situation to bring forth the birth of Jesus Christ. And I don't know who I came to preach to this first Sunday of Advent, the fifth Sunday in November. I want you to know that no matter what's going on and going wrong in your life, God is able to work through it for his glory in your life. I wish I had an eyewitness that knows that God worked through some things. He worked through what you're not proud of. He worked through what was hard. He worked through what you should have never done. He worked through what you should have never said. That's how good God is. Someone say, God worked through it. He is the God that works all things together for the good of them that love the Lord. Not just the righteous, but the ratchet. Not just the holy, but the ungodly. Not just the obedient, but the iniquitous. God can work through what's wrong in your life. So let me tell you, not only should you not disqualify other folks from the goodness of God, do me a favor, don't let the devil make you disqualify yourself. Oh God, you, you, you're not everything you should be. You haven't done everything right. You don't always walk the straight and the narrow every day. But I've come to tell you that God took a person like you and worked it all together for his glory. Somebody say he's talking about you. God can use anyone. God can work through anything. And watch this last one. God can redeem any story. I'm closing. God can turn any life story around. God can change the direction of any life. God can move and put value in a life that looked worthless. The Bible says, this Bible, the genealogy of Jesus starts off pretty good. Because Matthew, and you got, you, he names Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are some good Jewish names to, to lift up. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then it goes downhill. There are some unholy names on that list. There are some shameful names on that list. There are some hard situations on that list. There are some messed up moments on that list. There are some ups and downs on that list. It goes left more than it goes right. And when you read uh, verse 1 through 17, it ought to be like looking in the mirror because you've had some proud moments. But truth be told, you've had some ups and downs. You've gone left more than you've gone right. You, 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 you have gone backward more than forward. But then the Bible says there's one name on that list. One name that turns around the whole story. There's one name that overrides Rahab. There's one name that corrects Ruth. There's one name that changes Tamar. And that name on that resume is Jesus. Because whenever you see Jesus on the resume of somebody's life, that's a life that's been redeemed. That's a life that's been changed. Is there anybody listening to me that's got Jesus on the resume of your life and you can declare, I am redeemed. I've been bought with a price and Jesus has changed my whole life. If anybody asks you just who I am, just tell them that I'm redeemed. You ain't shouting, but you know what? This is the redemptive power of the story of Jesus Christ. Jesus will redeem the story of your life. After all those names comes the name of Jesus. And watch this. After the name of Jesus, no other name shows up. Because after I put Jesus on my resume, you can't define me by my past. After I've given my life to Jesus, all things have passed away and all things have become new. The only time you see 
another name written is in the Lamb's Book of Life. You need to know this morning that God can use anybody, including you. That's number one. That, that, that God can work through anything. That's number two. And number three, with Jesus, any story can be redeemed. I'm tired. God bless you. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking on this first Sunday of Advent. I'm done. I'll see you this Thursday night as we teach on the meaning of Advent. Meet me on Thursday night, 8 o'clock, because as a Christian or uh, waiting on the return of Jesus, waiting the second return of Jesus Christ, you need to know what Advent is. So God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking. I'll see you Thursday night as we teach about Advent. Remember, there's only one name on your resume that can change the whole thing around. This is Pastor Gilbert speaking. God bless you. See you soon. Shalom, shalom.